Um, our panel consists of myself. I'm the uh, founder of Vertive and Offers.com. We'll go through bios shortly. Um, David Lewis from uh, Cashback. Uh, Will, Gill from, Will Martin Gill from eBay. And uh, Chris Simons from Travelocity. Like I said, we'll have introductions shortly. I'm curious how many are affiliates or publishers? Show of hands. So if you could, someone could be the statistician here and count those or estimate them. Um, of those that have their hands up, how many currently work with eBay? So we got some eBay affiliates. And how many currently work with Travelocity? So a couple of Travelocity affiliates as well. Um, what about merchants or advertisers? So about a third and a third so far. And uh, networks, affiliate networks? Got uh, three or four, five. Um, what about agencies or consultants? A couple of those. Uh, vendor or service providers? Anyone selling technology to these? Got one. Uh, any industry analysts? I, I put that in almost for humor because the industry analysts don't cover this industry yet. So there couldn't be industry analysts in the audience. Um, uh, press or media? All right, so we can kind of say whatever we want. Any other? Did we forget anybody? So how long has everybody been in the industry? Who's been in less than a year? Show of hands. So about a quarter. And what about between a year and three years? About a third. And what about over uh, three and five years? Between three and five years? A few more. And what about over, over five years? And I think all of us have been in over five years. Um, all right, quick introduction on performance marketing. Um, just so we all get on the same page, um, the primary forms of online marketing include CPM, CPC, and CPA. Um, we're considering what we're doing today or what we're talking today. Uh, CPA, we can call it affiliate, we can call it performance marketing. Um, either word uh, kind of works. Uh, and then on the publisher side, there's multiple business models. Um, there's direct linking affiliates. Um, these are both through search and ad networks. Um, got niche sites and blogs, um, coupon and deal sites, uh, and cashbacker points. One of the important things for this uh, to understand about this is when you talk about affiliates or relationships, the type of affiliate or the type of publisher is going to somewhat determine the level of support they need and the level of support they want. Um, if you've got a blog that does nothing but uh, write about a specific, you know, let's say it's a travel blog, um, they might be a little bit more knowledgeable about the travel industry than, say, a mommy blog that writes about travel uh, once in a while. Maybe the mommy blog writes about it, you know, uh, once in a, you know, once a quarter or something. So it's it's really important as as whether you're an affiliate or whether you're an advertiser to make sure you understand the business model of whoever it is uh, you're working with on the publisher side. Um, when we look at actions, um, we think there's three types of main actions in the performance space. Um, there's leads, which could be an application or a loan, um, and there's a, usually a lead feed on that. Um, a new customer for new customer acquisition. Um, of the advertisers in, in the house, how many are doing uh, leads? The advertisers, and how many are doing a new customer? And then how many is it on tra the transaction? So a little bit more on the transaction side or the sales side. I shouldn't say the transaction, I mean the sales side, um, where there's a percentage of the sale. Um, on the uh, publisher side, there's three primary business relationship models. Uh, you can have in-house programs, uh, that's like, like an eBay, where they've got an in-house program. Um, you can have private label websites as part of that, or the merchant can have their own, basically their own affiliate system that they've built with their own technology, or that they've built um, or licensed from another uh, source. Um, and then there's affiliate networks, which is the primary um, mechanism which most companies work with uh, between advertisers and affiliates. And there's sub-affiliate networks or ad networks. Um, one of the interesting notes about this industry um, is the commission rates that get paid. Um, it's one of the things we'll talk about briefly when we have our discussion, but in terms of how do you determine how much to pay um, your affiliates. You know, the affiliates always want more, at least that's the assumption, and the, and the reality is a lot of affiliates just want their fair share. Um, when you look at the stats from uh, shop.org, um, what you see is retailers are spending more per new customer in other channels than they are in the performance space or the affiliate space. Um, affiliate programs, it's cost about $12 per average order, whereas online banners, the average is 84 
Uh, so the advertisers out there might be thinking, oh great, we can pay our affiliates less because look, this chart shows that. And really what the chart is illustrating is that this is what's happening with a lot of programs now. That does not mean that's the best or most effective way uh, to run a program. Um, in, in, in reality, each program is different and you've got to figure out if you're an advertiser, you know, what the right amount to pay is. But it, it's just of note to, to, to understand that in, in many cases, affiliates are getting underpaid um, for the value they're being provided. Uh, and this chart kind of illustrates that. Uh, and it's just something to keep in mind. And show of hands, how many people actually love this slide? <laughs> <laughs> this is David's favorite slide. It's, it's, it's one we'll talk about more, and you'll, you'll hear more and more discussion about it as the industry matures, and as more analysis gets done about um, how do you figure out how much to pay. Um, when I, I ask a lot of merchants that, well, how, how do you decide how much to pay your affiliates? And they say, well, that's just what our competitors pay. And sometimes that means they're paying too much, and sometimes that means they're paying too little. Um, it really needs to come down to um, your specific metrics as an advertiser. Um, and likewise, as a publisher, it, it's not always about you know, getting more. It's, it's trying to find a, a balance between what's the fair amount that the company can pay versus the value being provided. Um, so one of those, th that issue really gets to the heart of why performance marketing works, is that the advertiser or the merchant gets to determine how much they're going to pay for a transaction. Uh, and with that, uh, the publisher gets to decide whether that's a fair amount and they're willing to drive transactions for that amount. At any given time, um, the publisher can choose to promote a different advertiser, and the advertiser can either raise or lower their rate uh, to... to create more demand for, uh, from, from the affiliate networks or from the, uh, the, the, the partners they work with. Um, the channel tends to be very, very cost effective because of that, um, but it often ends up at times where um, some companies just don't do enough analysis uh, in terms of what's the right amount to pay. Um, we like to tell companies, think of your affiliates as an extension of your sales force or extension of your sales and marketing department. Uh, and, and, and treat them as such. And, and with that then comes uh, one of the main reasons why performance marketing works is you'll get a lot more creativity uh, than just one marketing department. If, if you're a marketing department and you're selling shoes, um, you're going to think of 10, 20, maybe 100 ways to sell shoes. If you've got 10,000 affiliates all selling your shoes as well, uh, there's 10,000 different ways uh, perhaps to market or to sell your shoes. Um, so when, when we, we think about why this channel works and why it's so effective, uh, a lot of it comes from the creativity of having so many uh, potential affiliates. Um, one other note uh, about the, the, the industry is how big it is. Um, the Performance Marketing Alliance, which is a new trade organization that, uh, that was formed over the last couple of uh, months and actually over the last year, um, is, is estimating that it's over $3 billion dollars. Um, the analysts, uh, Jupiter, have put out a, fo a forecast that shows it's about a, a $2.3 billion industry, uh, but we believe this doesn't include lead gen. And when we look at performance marketing, we think it's important to not just look at retail sales or retail transactions, but to also look at new customers uh, as, as well as lead gen. Um, the point I'm trying to make here for those that uh, work, whether it's a small company or a large company, is that this is a very, very big channel. It's a very effective channel if it's done right, uh, but it's also very, very large in terms of its scope. So if you're at a, a medium-sized company or a big company and you're not getting enough resources, or if your affiliate budget is, is too small, or frankly, if you have an affiliate budget, some of this data and some of these statistics might be able to help get you, get you more resources to help grow your program. Um, so I've got some quick introductions from the panel. Um, I'm the, as, as I mentioned, I'm, uh, I've been involved in the internet since 1995. I founded Vertiv in May of uh, 2003. I've been active in the industry since then. I speak at a lot of industry conferences, uh, and I'm a board member of the Performance Marketing Alliance um, and a leading performance publisher. Um, we've got 25 plus websites. In February of this year, we launched uh, offers.com, uh, and we won an award for that from uh, Linkshare. I'm going to let the panelists introduce themselves. Hi, I'm David Lewis. I'm the CEO and founder of Cashback. Um, I'm less interested in myself and more about the issues, which is why I tried to do this more towards that. I've been lobbying against the advertising tax in California. How many folks are familiar with what's going on with that? 
Uh, and you know, there's another panel right now going on on just that topic. If there's time at the end, I'd be happy to give the two-minute update. But basically, uh, states are trying to leverage affiliate relationships to collect sales and use tax, and they're actually not going to succeed at what they want and will only hurt us. The other one is data feeds. How many of the, um, the uh, advertisers out there have data feeds? How many of the publishers use them? There, there are um, a lot of problems that you know, we need standardization in the industry on data feeds, and I'm trying to work to promote that. And by the way, click again. I did not invent the internet, sorry. <laughs> that was Al Gore. <laughs> Hi, I'm uh, Will Martin Gill. I'm a director in internet marketing for eBay. Head up the uh, North America and Asia Pacific affiliate programs on eBay. Um, we've had an affiliate program since 2001. <coughs> Until last year, uh, it was an outsourced program, so we had Commission Junction actually running our program. And then uh, after about a year's worth of uh, internal planning, we launched our own platform last year, uh, and we've been running an in-house program, uh, as Steve mentioned, uh, ever since. So we are a little bit unique in the uh, kind of merchant space in the sense that we combine paper lead and paper action. So we'll pay for new users that affiliates drive to eBay as well as a percentage of the transactions that they help drive. Um, and we've got now about uh, 100,000 affiliates in 27 different countries. So we also have a lot of programs in Europe uh, from uh, many different business models out there. Chris Simons, I'm with Travelocity. Um, I oversee our branded affiliate program, which we do through CJ. And I also oversee some of our top private label uh, partnerships that we have as well. And, um, you know, just um, you know, here to offer whatever insight that we can from the uh, from the merchant side of things and uh, you know happy to answer any questions great so so on that note I've got the, a quick question for the audience which is um, what is the key to a lasting publisher and advertiser relationships to lasting publisher and advertiser relationships anyone have any any thoughts on that just blurt it out yeah communication communication that's one with anyone else everybody makes money everybody makes money Trust. trust Anyone else have any, any thoughts on that? Those are, those are really actually three good ones. Um, we, we like to say that it comes down to results, which requires communication, requires trust, and it requires uh, a whole lot of other things. Um, so how do we achieve res results? So on that, I'm going to open it up for, uh, for, the, for the panelists. Um, we'll let Will go first, and maybe tell us what you think the top three things are uh, that enable a, an effective partnership and effective relationships? Yeah, so, um, so absolutely. I mean, I think communications are extremely important overall. Um, and we, we try to get out there. I think there's no substitute to picking up the phone and talking to your top affiliates and really understanding um, what it is that is driving them, how they're promoting your brands, what they're interested in, what they need to make sure that they um, are promoting you as effectively as possible. And we've gotten a lot of insights. We'll get a little bit more into some of the best practices here, but we've gotten a, a lot of insights there. Um, the second kind of big thing is just to um, make sure that when you are figuring out who to bring into your program, you're not just following that mantra of, um, um, I need more volume. Right? I think that it's a mistake for merchants to just go out there and get as many affiliates as they possibly can. And conversely, I think affiliates need to be targeted about which merchants they are uh, actually trying to, to bring in and, and promote for. I think the more targeted you can be for the type of content that you have and the type of business model that you have, the more effective you're going to be. Um, and then kind of the last big thing, um, among many others, is compensation. I mean, I think for a long, long time in this industry, there's been the... Uh, thought that, gee, you know, we, we're going to have an industry where we pay per lead and pay per transaction. You're going to pay pretty much every affiliate the same. Maybe your biggest affiliate, because you have a special relationship with them, you'll go ahead and give them uh, a special commission rate for a certain amount of time. They can give you a certain amount of volume. Some of the studies that we've actually done since we've 
uh, taking the program in-house and started looking even more closely at the data says that some of our smaller affiliates are actually some of our best affiliates. When you look at metrics like lifetime value of customers, uh, look at metrics like revenue that we get per click that they deliver to us. And so uh, part of what we've been trying to think through is how do you revamp your compensation system so that you're not just rewarding kind of your biggest 10 affiliates, but really you're reaching into um, the, the, the mid and long tail of the people in your program and, uh, and, and really reward them. Uh, David, what do you think? Yeah, I, th I think in all relationships, whether business or personal, whether inside your company or with other companies, it always comes down to communication. And it, it, it's one of those cliches. You always hear companies saying, you know, we, we need to get back and get communication working better. And that really is how it works. You know, as I look at problems that we have with <coughs> advertisers at times, it's usually based on poor communication. We try, you know, we work with over three, or close to 3,000 stores. And it's tough to communicate with all of them, obviously, but we try to look at our top ones and build relationships with them so that we can make sure there aren't those problems. Um, I, I think another thing is working based off of the numbers. You know, it shouldn't be a knee-jerk reaction that, oh, so-and-so thinks that it should be this way. You know, we're taking a guess. We had a uh, large online shoe retailer, I won't mention any names, but right before it was sold recently, <laughs> they decided to terminate all of their loyalty or cashback sites. And we, we said to them, you know, why? We went through it. They, they said, well, you know, we think that you're just returning our shoppers to us. And we said, no, we're actually sending you, you know, our members. And they assumed that they'd be able to keep se at least 70% of the, um, the shoppers. And we assumed it would be closer to 20%. And our, our network agreed with us. The, the question is, does that work out? And we're still waiting to hear from them if they're going to run the numbers and work off of the numbers. Because you know, if they said 70%, fine, that might make sense for them. But there are so many times that we find we get terminated from a program because somebody thinks something will be a certain way and they don't bother running the numbers. So the, the one thing that I always ask the advertisers we work with is set your compensation structure, decide whether you work with us or not. Whatever the action is, you know, decide how you're going to have your search policy, but do it based off of numbers and not based off of what you think it might be. Chris, what do you think the three things for an effective relationship are? I'm going to stick with probably like one or two there. Um, and I think the biggest one for us, especially from what we've seen within our program within the last 12 to 18 months, has been communication. Um, you know, also internally, but also with, with our affiliates as well. Um, you know, we had a lot of a lot of things internally going on where you know, it seemed like a lot of the affiliates were finding a lot of the different sales we had on um, Travelocity <clears throat> well after the fact, before it was ever even pushed out through the program and stuff. So I think we've done a pretty good job internally getting our stuff together and then reaching out to the publishers and, uh, you know, you know, hopping on calls with, you know, top 50, top 100, trying to, you know, go a little further down into more of the long tail publishers, just like Will said there. To find other opportunities, you know. Also, when we work with the publishers, trying to figure out exactly what the needs are. And you're mentioning about feeds and everything. That's a big thing for us right now. Try to make sure that everything that we're doing internally at, within Travelocity, we're getting out there to the network, and making sure that it's available um, for the publishers. And then, you know, hearing, you know, hearing, hearing what the affiliates and the publishers have to say, finding out what those needs are, and then taking those back internally, and um, seeing what we can do to to upgrade, you know, in those different areas. So, so, so for, for me, our three, it's, you know, I, I like to stick with the C's. So we say communication, conversion, and channel partner. Um, we, we think that if you get the communication right, the, at the end of the day, the most important thing is to develop the relationship around thinking of us as a partner. Um, and that then means, are we paying a fair amount to our partner? Um, and we, we ask the same question back. You know, we don't want a merchant to pay us so much that they can't afford uh, for us to send them the, the, the quality visitors or quality customers that we do. So it goes both ways. It's not just a matter of, you know, you know give us more money, which is, you know, often the, the, the stereotype that, that, that affiliates uh, get, get accused of. But for us, it's about what's a fair amount. Uh, and that's why we use the, uh, the, the, the channel partner as the example. And, and the third being conversion rate, um, the, the, the best way to improve the results for everybody in most cases, is for the merchant to improve the conversion rate. Um, we sit down with merchants often and uh, look at their sites and figure out how to help them improve their, uh, their conversion rate. Um, you know, maybe it's taking a step out of the shopping cart. 
Uh, maybe it's giving us access to deeper lengths. Uh, in, in some cases, it's just simply a matter of um, little things that they can do. Um, you know, and if you've got a you know, five or six percent conversion rate um, and you improve it by one percent, so if you go from five to six percent, that's a 20 percent improvement. Um, that's huge. Um, that just means we can drive more traffic with that increase in conversion rate. So we, we think that's actually the, one of the three most important things. But sticking on communication, because that's the, the most common, um, I'll go to David first and ask, how do you prefer to be communicated to or communicated with your, uh, the advertisers you work with? You know, that's a great question because I, I don't think there are any two publishers out there who necessarily like the, the same ways. Yeah, we, we like email, but in many cases the, you know, the affiliate email box just gets over, overwhelmed. You know, we just had a situation last week where we had, there was a, a semi-exclusive offer that was put out. It went into that box and it you know, wasn't very clear as to what it was and caused a, a pretty bad situation between us and one of our, our top partners. Um, but as far as email goes, you know, one thing we know is we don't really need to see banner ads. We don't need to see flashing banner ads because you know, we don't run a casino site, so we don't need to see all of your new flashing banners. There, there's one email that we get from, um, comes to one of the networks that's the first one I'll look for any day. It's just text. It's very simply, I know who it's from, I know um, the subject will tell me what it is, and there's just simple text that, is there an offer today or not? That's great communication. It doesn't have to be fancy. Uh, you know, I. I don't think the networks really offer a way to be able to email to your publishers in a way that you can target, you know, because different sites want different things. Um, but you know, email's always good. You know, we like to communicate by phone with anybody that we do a lot with or we're trying to do more with. There's nothing that beats a personal relationship. There's nothing that beats either talking or sitting down at a conference or you know, we'll even travel uh, to go to meet our. our our better partners, our larger partners, in person because that works best. I'm also a, an instant messaging junkie, so that works for my whole team. I've forced them all onto it. Uh, and then, of course, there's always phone. We try to set up, you know, calls and uh, you know, work closely with them. Um, what about you, Chris? What do you find the most effective? You know, I think we all would say the easiest probably is email, but you know, I think we've found probably within the last year or two, you know, hopping on a call, you know having a publisher come into one of our corporate offices somewhere or maybe going out to wherever they're located, you know, meeting with them and stuff is, is, has really been able to help our program. Um, you know, it's helped us, um, you know, understand their needs, understand what we can deliver to them. And, uh, you know, I think that's, that's, that's probably been the most effective thing for us. You know, some of them we have you know, weekly calls set up, monthly calls, you know, bi-weekly, you know, whatever it is that fits within our needs and also fits within the affiliates needs. I, I've, I've talked to um, merchants in the past, and I always find it amusing that um, at times a merchant will say they've never met their best partner. Um, in some cases, those partners are driving huge volumes for them. And I always find it a tad ironic. I mean, you know, one of the advantages, one of the reasons this industry works so well is that it's, um, you, you don't have to have that, right? We can, we can have an arm's length relationship, and, and, and that can work. Um, but we find the most success we have with the partners we work with is when we actually um, get on the phone with them on a regular basis or are emailing not just to our general mailbox that gets, uh, you know, 100 or 200 affiliate emails a day, but to, to the actual people in the, in the office that are managing uh, the, the, the accounts. Um, we find that to be way, much, much more effective. Um, of, of the advertisers out there, how many, how many have not met their top affiliates. And by Matt, that might mean in person, but, you know, or on phone. Is there anyone out there who hasn't? Now they won't admit it, but um, you, you have not? You've got, yeah, not all of them. Not all of them. Um, you know, reach out to them, call them up, set up a weekly call. Some of them aren't going to want it, but others of them will be like, like, wow, yeah, we, we probably should talk. You know, they might have some really good ideas for you. Yeah, but if you're going through a network, you don't necessarily have the information of the affiliates. You can email them. Don't let your network get between you and your partners, and that goes both ways. That you know, we we've had horrible, horrible situations come up because the network, 
you know, told the, the advertiser, oh, your top 10 don't want to talk to you. And they told us, oh, no, they don't really, they don't talk to their publishers. And then we get on the phone and we're both just going after the network because lo and behold, we've both been demanding to speak to each other. So don't allow it. I mean, you are paying them for a service and part of that service is the, the introduction to us. Yeah. So don't accept it. Tell them it's not acceptable because you know, there's no longer any exclusivity. The only barrier, and I know any networks here are going to start throwing things at me. Um, the, the only barrier to changing networks at this point is your um, is dev resources. Can you get your tech folks to actually put it up? Um, you know, the, the, if you're looking at networks, the best thing to ask are, how are you going to handle these situations for me and list out anything you have? How are you going to introduce me to new publishers? How are you going to help me build with my, my current ones? You know, what, what are you going to do for me? The, um, the, 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 that's a very important point. And just, you know, it, the, the relationship here really should be between the advertiser um, and, and the publisher. However, the networks provide a valuable service in the, in the middle of that relationship. Um, we don't want, you know, every advertiser calling us every day. So, to a certain degree, we've, you know, it, it's got to be limited. But at the same time, if there's a, especially one of your best partners or a partner you think could be your best partner, um, you know, reach out to them. They're really, it's really not that hard. Um, if, if you've got a really solid partner out there, it should be pretty easy to track them down and, and, and talk to them. What, what have you seen in this, Will? Yeah, I would just add the the personal face-to-face -face interaction is really important. I mean, again, we, we have a lot of affiliates, so it's going to be very, very hard to have personal relationships with each and every one. We do rely on email to communicate with a, a large number, but one of the things that we convinced ourselves, especially when we brought the program in-house, is that um, conferences like this one are actually a pretty important one to be at. So uh, we've actually had a booth at um, uh, almost every conference we've been to since the beginning of last year. So Affiliate Summit West uh, last year in Vegas, uh, East uh, again West this, uh, th this year, and we've been to Affiliate Convention. In each one, you end up finding a different facet of your program that you interact with, whether it's a couple of people from your boards, for example, that, that come up, your discussion boards, and introduce themselves to you after you've given a presentation, or people that come up to you uh, that, again, are in that mid-tail that come up to your booth and just ask you questions and get that personal interaction. We found it a really rewarding part of, uh, of, uh, of, of coming to these sessions. But you have to make the active effort to try to reach out to them. If you don't have any place for them to, to come meet you, whether it's a, a table at, at the meat market, for example, it's going on right now, or the, um, you know, a couple of other areas, it's, it's, it's hard for, for folks to come to you. You mentioned when we were talking on the phone in preparation that you guys have an, an affiliate day. Can you, can you talk a little bit about that? And then also, when, when you're done, Chris, if you can get, share your thoughts on that. Yeah, so we've actually had an affiliate day for, for now two or three years. Now, again, uh, we can't invite all of our affiliates to that day. What we end up doing is... You don't want 100,000 <laughs> affiliates coming to your office? Only if we take over a very, very large, uh, giant stadium um, in San Francisco. But no, so what, um, what, what we end up doing is taking our top... Uh, 50 affiliates and bringing them in for uh, a, basically a day conference. And we do a couple of readouts to our affiliates. Hey, what's our strategy going to be for the year? What are the types of promotions that we're looking for? What are some of the uh, big pushes in marketing that eBay is going to do in the following year? Because we want to build that relationship and, and get that interaction. This year, we uh, even had Lori Norrington, the president of eBay Marketplaces, come in and do a presentation to share eBay strategy with, with this group of folks. People reacted very well to it. But the, the most important part of it, though, was kind of the, the afternoon session. We typically do, a, it's all discussion-based. So we'll have a lot of Q&A. We'll have people giving us input into what they would like to see in terms of creatives, enhancement to reporting and tools. And, and it's, been a, it's been a rewarding part of it. And one of the new things that we tried this year was actually to um, not just go with our top 50 affiliates. We also brought in a few of our top people from our discussion boards as well as other folks we had uh, relationships with and got their voices in there. Uh, and and uh, we, found, uh, we, we found a lot of success with that. And I think similar to what Will said there, you know, we have something today where, where we have our, you know, for, for our, our in-house private label program, you know, we do that now. Um, we're just starting now to, to do a similar, similar all-day type meeting for our affiliate program that we have through CJ. 
And uh, you know, it's going out there and just introducing everything that we have going on within Travelocity, all the different enhancements, you know, marketing promotions and stuff that we have going on, you know, and just basically having our affiliates understand the culture and, and the way in which we operate and stuff. And uh, you know, it's very helpful for us. You know, going back to your question, I, I would I would press the issue. You know, I think um, you know, kind of what um, they were saying over here a moment ago about how how there's that wall sometimes. You know, we saw that. You know, over the last couple of years, and uh, you know, I think as 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 a merchant, we really pushed, and, and now we're reaching out and, and having a lot of calls with a lot of the different affiliates that are out there, and uh, you know, just I mean, it's you know, communication is key, and and I think not only you know, on phone, but having these you know, all day sessions and stuff are very helpful. Yeah, you promised us an advertiser day. We're not quite you promised. I don't think Vertiv is is yet, but that, that's the only one I've heard. Uh, yeah, on the publisher side. Um, Will, you mentioned message boards a couple of times. Where do, where do you think message boards and discussion boards uh, fit in? But before you do, I want to just ask a show of hands, um, how many of the f uh, folks in the audience participate, um, whether it's Lurk or Post, on any of the uh, industry message boards? So a, a handful, maybe about a, a quarter or a fifth. Uh, where, do you, where do you see them fitting in? What, what can you share? Message boards for us, um, it, it's a little bit of a, a love-hate relationship in the sense that um, we, we have found a lot of really good feedback from affiliates on our message boards. So I'll, I'll put that out there and I'll say, I think that, that is the first place where you're going to see if there's something that's going on with your program. Um, you know, those are the folks in the front lines. Those are the people that are going to let you know about it and they're going to be very honest about it. Um, and so uh, we have continued to, to, we actually sponsor our own boards on eBay Partner Network and, uh, and, and we have uh, uh, folks that, that monitor that. I'm, I'm on there on a regular basis as well as uh, a number of my teammates. Um, what becomes challenging is that boards are also very easily abused. And I think that there are uh, a lot of people that, because it's an anonymous place to go and put comments, anybody that has any gripe whatsoever with the program, what they got paid, and you know, who, whoever thinks that, that they're getting paid enough, right, um, uh, in, in some of these situations. But um, you know, you, you'll, you'll end up having a little bit of just that rant feel to some of these threads, and it's, it's very hard to respond in a constructive way to some of these. So part of what um, we try to do is build up relationships with uh, some of the posters out there to, to, to really try to balance the boards a little bit and make them as constructive as possible and put some kind of terms and, and conditions, uh, we should call them, of, of using the boards to make sure. We, we have no problems with negative feedback and, 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 and constructive feedback. We'll leave it up there all day, but it's really when it goes beyond that to, um, uh, to, to, to less constructive talk that, that we have real problems with it. D David, Chris, anything to add on message boards? No, I mean, our, ours is just a bit different. I mean, message boards really don't play for us today within the affiliate world. Ours is mainly for the end user customer. So we really don't see it impacting us too much today within our partner network. Dave, nothing? Nope. So uh, see if there's any questions from the audience. Well, we can take questions on anything, but we'd really like to keep it focused on uh, effective partnerships or effective relationships. Um, if, any questions that uh, anyone would like to ask? Yeah? Uh, yeah, I got a question about maintaining the relationships, communications. Uh, is there any sort of uh, CRM software that you use uh, in-house, or can you use uh, third-party software for that to keep track of all the relations? Uh, are you an advertiser or a publisher? Um, uh, both. Well, so for us as a, as a publisher, we're actually using Sugar CRM, um, and uh, you know it's open source. And uh, I, I don't even remember if it's one that you, you pay a license for or not. If it is, we paid for it, but it's it's not expensive. Um, we, we keep hoping that it will integrate better with some of the other tools out there eventually, um, but, but right now it's, it's pretty manual. You know, we have to type all the, uh, the merchants in there. It, it's, it, doesn't, um, it doesn't sit on top of you know, the, the networks or the, uh, the advertiser platforms. Others? We've built some uh, functionality on top of the eBay Partner Network, so we uh, we use that. We're in talks with a couple of third-party vendors as well to leverage some of their uh, CRM functionality. Uh, but you know, it's it's a little bit of of a mishmash with, especially when you have a, a program as large as ours, you end up having a number of people kind of interact with 
uh, with publishers, and so we're trying to get better every day at making sure that the notes that people take when they talk to different folks are in one consolidated place so that everybody can, can take a look at them and really act on things and continue conversations, not start from scratch every single time. I think that's really important. Yeah, for good or bad, we accidentally built our own. Uh, it's in integrated into our, our merchant database, and you know, we, we track so many different things about the stores we work with, um, you know, from you know, the, the cash back amount that we, we pay to you know, the commissions to whether they allow trademark bidding or any type of search. You know, there, there's several other things, they allow coupons, that we've just, over time, integrated more and more ourselves. We do use a CRM um, function, and, and not just for our partner network, we actually have it across the entire company. So it's, it's very helpful, and, and you know, with us being a, a company that's spread all over the world, um, it definitely helps us be able to communicate with our partners um, overseas and also um, with our counterparts internally as well. Uh, other questions? Yeah? I'm very new to affiliate marketing just a few months in, and I'm looking to really change our program. And one of the things you guys mentioned was ways to incentivize the publishers who may not be in your top ten, who typically seem to be the ones who are always getting the perks and things. Can you give some examples? So, so the question is about examples of how to incentivize those that aren't in your top ten so that uh, they can grow. Or even change up your payment structure to yeah. So I'll give you one example um, that we actually instituted in the summer of last year. So we used to pay for every new lead, we'd pay between $25 and $35 for every new customer that came to eBay, um, confirmed the email, and then bought something or placed a bid on eBay. Uh, and we would vary between $25 and $35 depending on the size of the affiliate, so how many new users they actually brought to us in a given time period in a month in, in this case. Uh, what we found, though, is that there was a very, very big discrepancy in the terms of the lifetime, average lifetime value of the customers, the different affiliates were actually bringing to our program. And we actually plotted that same chart. I wish I had uh, some of the slides here to, to show you guys, but we plotted that same chart um, across volume and we said, well, you know, is it the biggest publishers that actually give us the best leads? And lo and behold, there's almost no trend line that kind of shows you that, that the bigger publishers are always bringing you the best leads. So we actually changed our program and we now uh, pay anywhere between one and $50. Um, depending on the lifetime value that we calculate from the affiliates. And actually, because we ended up getting um, uh, some of the publishers that were leading uh, worst customers to us on that $1 tier, we were able to move the entire average of the program. Most affiliates were getting paid $25 in the old system. We moved to $28, the, the entire basically average of the program. And a number of people were getting paid at $40 and $50, which is higher than the even highest tier that we had before. All of that, again, because we got better about paying the better affiliates more. Well, one thing I'd like to add is as far as when you communicate to your targeted publishers, the one you want to add, the ones you want to work with, is know my business. Don't contact me and say, here's what I have, here's what I'm offering, this is just, you know, the, the vanilla package that I offer to everybody. It's not even that you need to tier, but here's how I think you can drive sales for us. Here's, you know, where we could be on your site. Here are the types of things that you can do based on my understanding of your business. Well, you might be wrong about certain things we do. It doesn't matter. If you've taken that extra step, you know, we're, we're more willing to talk. I, I'm, I'm pretty harsh on bad salespeople that, you know, the phone rings and, you know, there's always a groan and, you know, there's one person who gets to field all of those, because one time I answered the phone, and this is one of my favorite ones. Hello. Hi, do we have an ATM in your office? I'm looking around, and you know, it's not that big an office. I'm thinking, no, and I, my question back was, why? You know, and it's somebody who obviously didn't know who she was calling or why. Now, granted, you know, if you were calling us, you already know something. But just sell to me, don't sell to anybody out there on the street. Yeah, I guess I'd add to that as a, as a publisher, um, we, we tell merchants all the time, you know, check our site. The easiest thing to do is, um, you know, maybe if, you, if you've got a, a thousand uh, publishers, you know, maybe it's 10 a day for, for you know, for 100 days. Um, check the site. Make sure they've got the latest offers. Um, if, if we're sorting your offers in a particular way and you think there's a more effective way to do it, uh, let us know that. Um, it's amazing how much difference that can make. Um, we can't possibly become an expert on every category 
um, that we promote on offers.com. We just can't. It's, um, so we're really counting on the, on the merchants to, to come to us and tell us what, what we can do better, what we can do differently. And sometimes it's that simple. Um, that not, might not make us go from you know, number 100 to number you know, 10, but if, if you do that with all, all of your you know, kind of uh, tail uh, uh, affiliates, I think you'll see a huge increase in your program. Uh, yes? Um, I'm, an ad, I'm, I'm an advertiser, and I want to know how you can find super affiliates in a specific category. Because I work with CJ now, but there's no way yeah. Well, well, first off, I'd ask the hypothetical question of what super affiliate even means. But beyond that, um, if you're talking about uh, the biggest affiliates, that might not be the best affiliates for you. What you really want to find is who should be selling or promoting whatever it is you do. Do you want to share what that is? Um, it's, it works at Trump University. For Trump University? It's, uh, more like real estate investing um, information education. So if I, if I type in real estate education, are you prominently displayed in the top 10 sites that show up in those search results? Um, we, we do PPC. Yeah, but I'm talking about SEO. I mean, Organic. sometimes it's just about surfing and finding places that if you were a customer, you might look for your product um, and, and going, uh, going about it that way. Um, just because someone's the biggest affiliate, you know, they might be the biggest affiliate in, uh, you know, in credit cards and not want to sell uh, Trump University. Or, you know, maybe they're a, um, a big affiliate in another category. So be careful about terms like super affiliate. And in, in my opinion, the thing you want to do is figure out who should be my biggest affiliates and go after them. Anyone want to add anything to that? I think there's a couple services out there that you might also want to take a look at. So uh, have you ever heard of a company called Centrix? Um, so Centrix um, is, is a company that basically has mapped out a lot of the different links out there on, on the web. And so they can tell you who is advertising for whom and uh, give you some statistics. Now, sometimes it's a little bit hard, just like you know Nielsen and Comscore and everybody else. I mean, it's, it's hard without extremely large, very well-vetted panels to get a lot of reliable data. But it's certainly an interesting um, directional indicator of some of the biggest advertisers on the different affiliate networks, as well as for some of the uh, so, some of your competitors, uh, if they're out there. Another company is uh, Compete.com. Like Nielsen and, and Comscore, Compete has a number of uh, people that they have. They have um, uh, relationships with uh, some, some of the internet providers out there and get some statistics and data and might um, uh, have some data sets that allow you to get where people have been to and how they got to certain sites. And so you can, based on that, then kind of backwards engineer, OK, where are some of the biggest people in your sector getting traffic from? Um, so two to check out. And Google's also going to tell you, both SEO and SEM, take a look at the keywords that are valuable to you. Who's showing up there that you know, aren't your competitors, but are your potential partners, both in the natural results and also in the paid results? Yeah, question. And uh, kind of the tail end of that, when we're just getting started with a program that uh, what we're running into is that there's a behemoth competitor that's already well established, has been doing the same thing that we do for years. And I mean, when we reach out to people, we reach out, you know, we've started the phone calls, we started trying to connect with people. But the first question we always run into is they're already advertising our competitor. What can we do that's better than them? And they have, they have the advantage of having the initial position. You know, they have the first move. They have higher payouts. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a, that's a great question. Sometimes the, the basics are what we recommend. Um, send review copies. If it's a food item, send the, fight, the item for somebody to taste. Um, if you've got a competitive grid that shows why your product is better, share that. Um, if you've got an inferior product and you're new to a market, you're going to have a really tough time. Um, you know, maybe you can try special promotions. Or, or special offers that you want to give to a certain uh, subset of, of affiliates and test it out that way. Um, I, I think you've really just got to stop and say, think of it as a channel problem. And you know, they've got more shelf space than I do. I'm new. How can I get more shelf space? Anyone want, want to add anything to that? No, you guys have any, any questions you want to ask each other? <laughs> <laughs> you want to go ahead? Plenty you should ask, Steve. <laughs> Let me see. Um, I have a question for the audience. What are the four words you hear or expect to hear most from publishers? Pay me more money. 
<laughs> I, I hope that's not it. You know, because uh, you know, the, 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 that was, you know, that's how do I get door. rich fast? Yeah. Yeah, no, because I, 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 I don't allow that from my, my team because we look for long-term partnerships. I don't want to make money off of one of our advertisers today. It's like, cool, how can we you know, rip them off as much as possible and move on? That is how affiliate marketing is often viewed and not how any of us would want to see it. It's, you know, pay me more money is something different. And one of the things is that you know, we, we view it a little different. We'll actually take less money, which shocks people very often. You know, we don't want to get paid for free trials on cashback because those are a perverse incentive. And there, there are other situations where if we want to tier it, we do it less. So my, my question, though, let's start with uh, the gentleman to my, my side. So I guess I'll start here. We um, fortunately have two of the more complicated um, industries up here between travel and auctions that the, the compensation structures are often very complex. How is it that you structure it, and how do you make changes for different types of publishers? So, you know, we, we have a lot of algorithms that we run internally here um, at Travelocity that basically looks at all, all of the different products. And especially here, I mean, it's, it's, it's funny, it's, and it's a very hot question for us recently. If you've been following a lot of the press over the last few months, you notice that us, along with the other OTAs, have all dropped our service fees with an air. So obviously air is a place right now where, you know, there's little to no money. So a big focus for us is to drive as much as we can either in the hotel path or in our total trip path. Total trip is what we call vacation packaging, is which is when you combine air and hotel together, and um, you know basically trying to trying to find those those high margin areas where we can incentivize people on those, and then keep our expenses in some of the other areas where we may not make as much money, especially now in air or you know some of the other areas, and, and just try try and find a balance there. Obviously, we have our default payouts, which are all available through the networks, but then depending upon relationships, you know, you were mentioning earlier about incentivizing and stuff like that. You know, we do have certain things set up with, with different publishers out there uh, to try and drive more, more volume in uh, more of those higher revenue, I mean, higher margin products, especially a hotel, to move people away from air, um, you know. And then, you know, as much as I hate to say it, but obviously finance drives a lot of that. You know, I mean, we all think from a, from a partnership communication standpoint, you wish you could always make those decisions. But, uh, you know, especially in a business like ours, you know, we do have a lot of those financial models that we, that we go on sometimes and then uh, just try and weigh that out. So, Will? Yeah, Will, you, you, eBay tends to have, dare I say, one of the more confusing compensation <laughs> structures. Um, how is it that you, it, it was uh, created that way? Um, what limitations do you have, and how are you able to effectively communicate that? So I've talked a little bit about um, how we pay out for new users. The part that also gets even more complicated uh, sometimes is how we pay out for the transactions. So we actually won't pay as a percentage of the item value, and that's um, there's a bit of history behind that, but because it's a marketplace and because sometimes weird things can happen when two people that you're not controlling are buying and selling from each other, um, uh, you expose yourself to, to certain amounts of fraud there uh, if you don't do this carefully. What we've done is actually pay a percentage of the revenue that we make as eBay from a transaction. And we make revenues because sellers are paying us listing fees for just getting their products on eBay. They pay us a final value fees that we call them for when somebody actually converts and, and sells something on eBay, and then feature fees, which if you want your listing bolded or um, at the top of the search results and things like that, there will be um, uh, a couple of additional fees. So we'll, we'll take all of that in and we'll pay a percentage to an affiliate, uh, which is 50 to 75%. And, and usually that's been the best of, of all world for us in the sense that there's value created in there for, for us, for eBay. A, a transaction happened and, and an item got sold, and we'll be able to, to, to credit that to the affiliate. I think the, the big, so first, we do recognize that it's not one of the simplest uh, systems out there, and so we're working for, uh, on ways to potentially simplify that. Um, the second is that we've started to also look at this concept of incrementality, which the way we think about it is, um, would a sale have happened were it not for the efforts of an affiliate? Because I think if you just look at metrics like percentage of transactions or new leads, you kind of lose sight of the picture that there are some affiliates out there 
they're wallpapering the web with your ads as well as every other affiliate's ads and just kind of raking in those commissions where if you do enough impressions, if you do 100 million impressions out there, you're going to get cookies on some machines and you're going to end up raking in the commissions that come from that versus other people that are creating you know, great cashback sites, great deal sites, great content sites with product reviews, very incremental um, types of sites. And what we're trying to do is evolve our compensation systems to pay those types of folks more um, and, and the former uh, a little bit less than, than what we do today. And so Steve, on the publisher side, what have you found to be effective in compensation structures or changes to compensation structures to get you to promote a yeah, store? So a lot of it comes down to there's some that we have a, um, if we're doing search marketing for, for an advertiser, um, we, we generally need to just get their best rate. Whatever it is, the best. That, and oftentimes, we can't get past square one without it because the, the ecosystem and pay-per-click is such that um, the, the costs for advertising um, are, are built, built around uh, what the value is of those clicks to either other affiliates bidding on those terms or other um, uh, competitors uh, who are bidding on those similar terms. Um, that aside, the thing that we've found the most effective is um, paying us on the lifetime value. Um, if you've got a, a lead or if you've got a new customer um, and you know what the lifetime value is, this works very, very well in the subscription space. Uh, we, we promote a lot of subscription products, whether it's a dating service or a newspaper or a magazine. Um, the, they're going to make a lot of their money on the renewal. Um, and the companies that take that into account and, and think about that value are, are often paying a higher commission and thus we get a better deal on it. Um, the higher our commission rate, the more volume we can drive because a lot of the traffic we are driving is from paid. Uh, e even if it's organic, we're going we're to spend a lot more time um, building out an area of our site for organic um, for, for a company where we're getting a high commission rate or a rate that we think is, is fairer based on, on the lifetime value. Um, the other easy one often is looking at the cookie length. Um, and, uh, and leakage on your site is, the, is, is a secondary one. Um, we were working with a partner and they had banners all over their sites. They said, well, well, nobody clicks on them. Well, then get rid of them. Or they have 800 numbers on all over their site and they say, well, but nobody calls the 800 numbers. So we'll get rid of those too because first off, we don't necessarily believe that, but there's a lot of ways you can improve your conversion rate which doesn't require um, increasing the commission rate. In the end, though, our commission goes up, and that's really the, the most effective way to, to achieve that. Did you want to add something? Um, I have a question, General. You, you guys are talking like uh, the perfect relationship between the affiliates and the advertiser and the network, but especially for Mr. eBay there. Um, when things go bad, like cookie stuffing, uh, <coughs> when there's fraud from the, the affiliates. And I'm an affiliate myself, and soon an uh, advertiser. And I uh, will be dealing with many networks at the same time. Mm -hmm. Is there a way to prevent, for example, uh, a shady affiliate from going to a network, to another, grabbing your offer, sending all the shit traffic? And is there a way to prevent fraud by, I don't know, turning in, into good traffic or, you know, when things go bad, what do you do? Yeah, um, it, it's, it's certainly a challenge of running uh, an affiliate program uh, and, and you will have some of this, uh, you know, cookie stuffing is one of those. Does everybody here know what cookie stuffing is? Um, essentially when you, you know, a lot of affiliate tracking ends up happening uh, when if you're clicking from a publisher site over to an advertiser site, a uh, cookie will get dropped on your machine. And so the way that we know whether a purchase was attributed to a particular um, publisher or not is by looking when somebody buys at the cookie on their machine and then you look at whether that cookie was from one publisher to the other. Well, there is one fraud model out there where people will go in and without people having clicked on ads, they'll just go ahead and automatically throw a cookie on every 
user that comes to their website. Um, and, and it's a real problem. And it's, um, you know, I, I think part of the ways to address it as an advertiser, you have to educate people that it's not okay to do things like that. It's ex uh, explicitly forbidden in our terms and conditions. And so um, that doesn't mean that, that people don't try. I think you need to build um, technology to, to help you seek that out and then um, find ways to also get, we've, we've also had other affiliates that they, they kind of police each other as well and kind of write into us. Because at the end of the day, it's the type of activity that, that hurts all of us in the industry, right? If we have to basically take down our commissions because we think that there's a certain level of cookie stuffing and other types of fraud that's going on, it's less money that we can pay to everybody else that's, that's legitimate. So I think it really is one of those areas where um, I, I do wish, to, to, to another point of your question, there was more of, a, of an industry approach to try to address some of what happens here, either through technology or relationships uh, or broader discussion. And don't auto accept. You shouldn't auto accept publishers into your program. That, that's number one. And so an easy way to catch it is take a look. See what, you know, see how you're going to appear on that site. See if, are they going to do things like cookie stuffing. And I have a question for you is, why are you going to launch on multiple networks? Uh, because it's a CDA offer, not CDA not for sale. But, yeah. Same, same question though. I would still ask the same question why. It creates a lot of confusion. It's a much harder to manage and track as well. Um, and it's uh, much harder to police. What about the, on new promises, a turbo saver that you can install onto your um, uh, search, uh, your browser, and uh, also on uh, the site called the One Cause? So what do you think about those kind of... Uh, I see nothing wrong with those. So, you know, I, I'm in the loyalty space, but Cashback is uh, probably one of the largest loyalty sites that does not have software, and that's partly based on time, not my view on the software. You know, we, I, I see loyalty sites as being the, the canaries in the coal mine, because if something's going wrong, we know. We have something that nobody else has, which is members who report to us when they don't have transactions tracking. You know, we have a coupon site. If things aren't tracking there, we have no way of knowing. But if it's not tracking on cashback, we know because people write in. Well, we've had almost no instances, very few times where when we do a transaction inquiry, we find out that a loyalty site got credit for it. And usually it's not based on software. It's usually based because somebody logged in at the other one. The problems we find are things like cookie stuffing or somebody went to a coupon site or a deal site after they went through cashback they click through either knowingly or not knowingly. And very often I think that it's more bad actors doing this and it's not knowingly. Those are the serious problems. The software for all of the noise that is made about this software on, on forums and boards, there's very little that they do that's wrong. They just remind people that they can use it. So we're, we're going to have time for about two more questions. Um, just a reminder for everybody, please fill out your survey or uh, questionnaire about the panel. Um, it allows uh, Sean and Missy to, uh, to, to, to provide great programming because they see what people actually like. Um, they do read them. They read every one. They compile all of the notes and share them with us as well. So uh, take the few minutes afterward and fill them out. The next session is going to be 3 o'clock, so we're all going to sit up here afterward, and you guys can come ask any individual questions. You had a question? Yes, I have a question about cookie stuffing for William. How do I know as a merchant if someone is cookie stuffing? Is there some, some kind of brick and run? Or how, it seems like a very difficult thing to know Yeah, unfortunately, it's not one of those obvious things that always pops out at you. Um, I think that if you go to these, I mean, if you go to these websites and use a tool like HTTP Watch, for example, where uh, it's a Firefox extension, and you look at what is happening as you're actually in the background, as you as a user are navigating through a site, it will tell you when a cookie is being dropped. And that will be a, a sure tell indicator of whether a cookie is getting dropped before a click um, actually happens. Um, but I think here, you know, it, it's part of just being vigilant. W one of the other questions that I had, and we're probably getting to the end of this, um, but is a little bit around um, you, you can only do some of that if you actually know where the referring URLs are coming from that publishers are bringing to you, right? And so um, we've actually started a campaign at eBay to try to reduce the number of unknown referring URLs from our publishers. Because there's some publishers out there where they're using middle servers, they're using a lot of different things to either um, uh, purposefully or just by accident 
mask almost everywhere that they're driving their traffic. So, um, you know, one one of my questions has been, you know, how much can we demand and 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 should we expect from publishers um, to tell us how they're promoting our brands out there? And it's oh. difficult sometimes to know what you are using because any publisher in TJ can say I'm using this domain, but then put the affiliate link on a completely separate URL. But you, you have the right as a, as a merchant to, to know where your stuff is showing up. You know, so if you've got an, an affiliate that's your top affiliate and their site doesn't have your offer on it, okay. you, you can probably ask them about that. I mean, it, I would say you should ask them about that. You know, you, you really, you have rights as advertisers as well as publishers have rights as well. I mean, we, we send traffic to places all the time where we get no conversions back. Um, we question that um, as, as a publisher. Advertiser has similar. If, if, if something doesn't seem right, um, call your network or, or reach out to the, pub, uh, the publisher directly. Also, there's a gray area that the, the definition of cookie stuffing needs to change. If you go to some coupon sites, they'll put up, click here to view coupons in nice <laughs> big letters, right? And below it is, and to go to the store. So the expectation that's being set for the user is they're going to be able to see the coupons because that's what they wanted to see on that page. Lo and behold, they click and they get taken to the store. The whole purpose of that is there's no coupons, but now they've stuffed the cookie. That, I think, is cookie stuffing, but it's not to the letter of what cookie stuffing is. Yeah, the networks don't think that's cookie stuffing. So then, um, you know, it's a competitive issue if, if you know, Ten sites are doing it, and you're not. How do you not uh, compete? I do, do think the industry has a lot of work to do in this regard, in terms of how to define some of this and how to help uh, each other. Right, and that's somebody's just looking for a short-term gain. They're not looking to provide the service that their site is claiming they are, either to the end user or to their, their the stores they work with. Great. So we're out of time. Like I said, we'll we'll stick around if anyone's got any other questions. Thanks, everybody, and remember to fill out your questionnaire. Thanks, guys.